I'm convinced that sample and reference applications do more harm than good when trying to illustrate domain-driven design. In a vacuum, I think they're a net negative. I'm Derek Comartin from CodeOpinion.com, and I say that because it's very difficult to convey the complexities and trade-offs being made with trivial code examples. Beyond that, these types of code samples are the wrong place to start. So where should you start? You should start caring. I want to thank Event Store for sponsoring this video. Event Store DB is a new category of operational database built for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on Event Store DB, check out the link in the description. So if you search GitHub and look for domain-driven design kind of sample applications, they're all going to look very similar to this. This one is a warehouse, so it's not just to do, it's a little bit more than that, right? So what you're thinking, this may be a great starting point. And it mentions domain-driven design. More specifically, it talks about things like protected properties and having our operations on entities and creation constraints, um, required and length attributes, value objects. Sounds like all things related to domain-driven design. This should be a good starting point. Now looking at the code, the sample is also using clean architecture. So I'm in the domain project. There's a product entity, we can see it here. And as mentioned, it has private setters, so we can't set those out publicly. So we have a private constructor here because we're using entity framework core, and we have different update statements or methods, I should say, which really are kind of trivial. They're just, well, they are trivial. They are making sure that the name can't be empty, making sure the length of the name can only be within a certain limit. And we're doing the exact same thing for the description. So, do we have really business logic here? Some would call this business logic. I really call it trivial logic. But what is this, like, is this really a domain model? So what's a domain model? Well, really, it's just an object model. It's a collection of related entities and value objects, but it's composed of both data and behaviors, encapsulating that data and exposing behaviors. And it's incorporating both and your ever-changing business logic. Now, you may not want to believe me, but I just didn't randomly make this up. It comes from Patterns of Enterprise Application Architecture. I've done videos on the past. I'll have links at the very end of this video on when to use a domain model, but to reference it, when to use it. It all comes down to the complexity of the behavior in your system. If you have complicated, and as I mentioned, ever-changing business rules involving validation, calculations, etc., that's where you want to consider using a domain model. But also, this last line is very important. On the other hand, if you have simple null checks, or what I was describing as trivial validation, and a couple of sums to calculate, a transaction script is a better bet. Now, transaction scripts are that. They're for handling simple requests. They might just interact with your database directly or through some simple abstraction, and they're generally usually pretty procedural when you kind of like look at them top down. Now, where things can kind of go sideways a little bit or when you see that you might be going too far with them, is when you have one transaction script that you feel like it needs to maybe call another one, or maybe you're starting to duplicate logic because you have this validation logic or something that needs to happen between post transaction scripts. So they went from simple to maybe not, or maybe needing each other now, or you have a lot of duplicate code. And this often revolves around state. Let's say we have a ship order, that's a transaction script. We do something within our database to set that order as we're sh we've shipped it, it's good to go. But then we have another request come in to the cancel order transaction script and that really shouldn't be able to happen because it's kind of based on the state of the actual order at that time. But what happens if we don't really have that validation logic correctly when changing the state? Because really it's just public getters and setters, they're just data buckets, we're interacting with our database directly. We may change the state of that order and cancel it when we shouldn't have. So that may be the time you start thinking, really we wanna encapsulate all this behavior, the ship order, the cancel order, and all the logic around what you can and can't do where behind a domain model, behind that object model, so that you're interacting with that and then persist it separately. So we think we have these handlers, wherever they are, these use cases, we interact, if we're talking about domain driven design, an aggregate, we're interacting with an aggregate root, and it's really kind of that boundary around those collections of related entities. It controls all the state and persisting everything together. When do you wanna do this? When you have complexity, when you start realizing your transaction scripts have gone too far. You don't necessarily start here. Now, of course, it takes discipline and awareness to realize, okay, these transaction scripts are getting out of hand. Maybe your progression is you start with a transaction script, then you move more to an anemic domain model, 
which is a not an anti-pattern. It's only an anti-pattern if you think you have a domain model, but you don't. But maybe you moved more towards that, and then maybe you move towards an actual domain model where appropriate. That's why I think these samples and reference applications are the wrong place to start, because they do not illustrate complexity. That's the whole point of applying these tactical patterns that they're trying to illustrate. And that's the other part of this. Sample and reference applications, why I think they're a net negative, is because they cannot really convey the complexity needed. They're sample applications, that's kind of the point. They're simple, they don't have a lot of complexity because otherwise you'd get bogged down trying to understand the actual domain that they're in, like warehousing. It's really not as simple as that sample. It's really complex, but it's not gonna illustrate all that domain complexity. It's the wrong place to start to be looking at code. Where should you start? You should actually start thinking about and caring about your domain. Now that means to some degree, code really is the last aspect that you're focusing on. Not entirely, but it's not the only thing you're focusing on. I'll have a link to the description. This is from DDD Crew on GitHub, and I think it's an awesome graphic to illustrate this. Is at the very start, is trying to understand what's the business model and the user needs. Like, what are we trying to actually accomplish here? Understanding the domain, doing things like event storming collaboratively with people in the domain, any type of stakeholder, anybody involved with the domain to really understand a lot of the workflows. What's the system that we're building? Trying to understand all that and decompose. I say, Decomposing a large system, defining these logical boundaries is one of the most difficult things to do, but it's one of the most important things to do. Strategize, because not all these logical boundaries are created equally. You're gonna have some that are more important, where really the magic and the complexity is, where your competitive advantage is in the system that you're building. You have all these logical boundaries. How are they all gonna to connect to each other? There's obviously kind of handoffs between workflows, between this boundary and this boundary. Who's gonna be writing the code? Organize your teams around this. That's where a lot of this comes from is really realizing we have this boundary. These are the people that are gonna be working on it, et cetera. Define the roles and responsibilities of that bounded context. What is it actually gonna provide? Code it, start coding, iterating. But you can see here, you just don't start with the code. Looking at these samples at the very beginning to understand this is how I do DDD isn't really the answer. You need to understand the domain. Domain-driven design is really just giving a sh** about the domain. It's understanding it and capturing those concepts in code. Knowing that you have a supporting boundary and that transaction scripts are totally fine, well, that's doing domain-driven design. Go beyond just looking at these samples and reference applications to get the gist of what domain-driven design is. It's beyond just the code. It's focusing on the domain. If you enjoy topics like this and you have thoughts, questions, or opinions of your own, you can join my channel and get access to a private Discord server where you can chat with other software developers. Check the link in the description on how to join. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment. And please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.